Good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, a Lime Creek Christmas. Lime Creek Christmas, I believe, was born almost 20 years ago when a brother of mine, Joe Henry, he and I used to get together on Christmas Eve and find one or another barns that were available to us. And uh, mostly Joe would do the decorating, putting carrots and apples on the Christmas trees that we gather. There would be a few candles around. The horses generally would have bows in their hair. And then we'd invite friends and neighbors and kids to come down and share with us Christmas Eve. We'd have eggnog and cookies, which are sadly missing tonight, and uh, sing Christmas carols and talk about what Christmas meant to all of us. But it was something that everybody participated in. And one of the things that happened for me that made it so very meaningful to me was that all of the old songs, somehow in this environment, the meaning of the words was so much greater to me, and I'll try to share that with you in my singing tonight. But anyway, Joe uh, took these experiences that we shared together, and in the way that he does, which is so very brilliant to me, he, he wrote it down. And later on, Anthony Zerbe, in the, the brilliant way that he does, is going to come and give you a couple of readings from that. I think that tonight, if you listen, that somehow, somewhere, Sometime, you will find something here that you remember. In any case, that is our hope. <clears throat> oh, come ye now unto the flame, keep it through the night. Nourish it and share its warmth And spend its precious light The torch is passed among us all To help us understand A covenant of brotherhood that joins our open hands. O oh, come ye now unto the flame, keep it through the night, nourish it and share its warmth, and spend its precious light. Eager souls are rising now, hungry for the wind. Each heart knows eternal love will bring us home, will bring us home will bring us home again. The season is upon now a time for gifts and giving and as the year draws to its close I think about my living the Christmas time when I was young the magic and the wonder but colors dull and candles and dark my standing under Oh little angel shining light You've set my soul to dreaming You've given back my joy in life And filled me with new meaning Savior King was born that 
day A baby just like you As the wise men came with gifts I've come with my gift too The peace on earth fills up your time And brotherhood surrounds you That you may know the warmth of love And wrap it all around you It's just a wish a dream I'm told from days when I was young. Merry Christmas, little Zachary. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas, little Zachary. Merry Christmas, everyone. Lime Creek falls down out of the high mountains and cuts across the ranch, and later joins up with Lost Horse Creek, which pretty soon runs into Crazy Woman Creek, running northerly into the Powder River. And the powder runs strong and hard all the way up into the Yellowstone, which it meets up in Montana. And the Yellowstone swelling all the time with all the waters it's collected from the Bighorn and the Rosebud and the Tongue and the Powder, rushes further northward and easterly too, until it finally joins the Missouri at the western border of Dakota. And the Missouri's come all the way across Montana, a hard journey too, from the high mountains of its own breeding. And when it gathers the Yellowstone, it finally feels itself big enough to relax itself into its fall southward, growing all the while as it bisects both the Dakotas on its far inevitable journey to the sea. And the mountain snows that melt and run along some crevice formed by shoulders of stone at 13,000 and then 12,000 feet, and then continue through the tundra running along the same timeless track of earth that some dead soul perhaps took from a Sioux or a Crow Brave, or perhaps from an old Cheyenne squaw, and called that eternal runnel of icy clear water in his own tongue, Lime Creek. And through wonderful good fortune, that special stream bathed silver-colored fish that I have eaten, turning their flesh into my own, and watered animals that I have loved, that have been the teachers and the artificers of my soul, the water forever falling, forever running downhill with yet its taste of the distant snows of its birthing. Return. A dazzling contradiction. The waterhole fading as you approach it. The gray that gathers, the lines that deepen, the dead and the dying, and the new lives blooming and flowered in the wind. For there is no returning, and we knew it all along as we dreamt of what we left, of what was finished and put away. And so it is not the myth of returning that we hold to, all our fairy tales long since spoiled, like broken dolls dashed to pieces in the stairless, dungeon-like attic, but to bear witness perhaps to some scene of far innocence, some unremembered gaiety fallen to dust and dimly potted with ancient tulips, or still filtering the sun through a dirty window, not even to hold the scene now magnified and embellished in the incubator of desire, those endless rocking nights, but simply to be there once again, the frost-bitten toes and the tree deep from the evergreen forest, all the more wondrous, standing and lit with candles. Tall in the saddle we spend Christmas Day Driving the cattle over snow-covered plains All of the good gifts 
given today Ours is the sky, the wide open Back in the city, they have different ways Football and eggnog and Christmas parades But I'll take my saddle and I'll take the reins It's Christmas for cowboys and wide open plains A campfire for warmth as we stop for the night Stars overhead For Christmas tree lights The wind sings a hymn As we bow down to pray It's Christmas for cowboys On this Christmas day Tall in the saddle, we spend Christmas Day Driving the cattle over snow-covered plains All of the good gifts given today Ours is the sky, the wide open range It's Christmas for cowboys and wide open That second winner with that filly of hers, I tried to make Elizabeth understand well before the mayor dropped the foal how it was too late in the year in our country for something to be born. Too late for the little one to be able to gain enough strength to make it through the winter. How when such a thing happened, it was always best for both the mama and the little one to do away with the baby, to let the mother get back to herself before the cold came and not prolong the life of the little one, no matter how strong it seemed at birth, for it would fight a painful battle with winter and lose, for the cold is always that much more powerful than the warm, than the fragile heat of life. But no, she absolutely refused to hear of it, refused to even consider what I wanted her to understand, which at the root of it was the very law of the land. Red or someone happened to be around the barn when the mare went down, shaken and all sweated through, She'd begun to tie up, which is something where an animal's muscles all seize up. We finally get a hold of our vet, Stoney, just coming into his dinner, and he comes and goes to work on her, and it, well, it seems as if one bad thing follows another. The mare can't really help herself with her hind end all bound up and all, and to top it all off, the baby's going to come breech. Stoney's up inside of her, trying to get the fold turned around some, but it's just no damn good, and all the while, Elizabeth's kneeling close to the mare's head, rubbing up and down her neck whenever the mare quiets down some, thrashing about with her head, making these god-awful groaning sounds, and then resting back down again. Stoney gets the little one's hind legs started with the smoke rising up off of his arm when he draws back out of her, and Red and I take over for him so he can take a breather, and we sit in the stall with our knees against each other, steadily drawn at the little one's legs. Now we can finally see where it's a filly for sure, but it seems to hang up on something inside of her, and the mare's thrashing and grunting against the thick hay that we laid down for bed. Stoney gets back between us, nudging us off to either side, and reaches back up inside her and gets the one foreleg that was bent straightened back out beneath the foal's chin, and he draws against it soaking hind legs, and then the baby suddenly slides out of her, so he folds backward with the foal lying on top of him. Well, he straightens back up with the baby in his lap and his arms around it, and he just sits there like that. Are you all right? I asked him. And he tells me he wants whatever blood that's left in the placenta to get into the foal before he cuts it loose from the mama. The mare lies back with her head stretched out, and Stoney finally ties off the cord and clasps up the foal and crouches with it into the next stall. Elizabeth brought Stoney a couple of blankets, and he kneels in the corner, 
with a baby curled up beneath them and his arms all around it like before with his head over his shoulder. And I can still see his lovely little face with its big eyes blinking innocently in the gloom of the barn as if it was thinking to itself, so this is life. So this is what all the fuss is about. Elizabeth stays with the baby and Stoney draws off the mare's first milk and tube feeds it into the fold through its nostril to be sure she gets the rest of it into her stomach. It's past nine o'clock and I send Red home for he's got a full day in the morning. I'm damned if I don't have to be down to Cheyenne myself. But the night has just begun as it turns out. When an animal ties up like that, its kidneys will shut down which eventually leads to its death. So the only chance is to keep the fluids running into her with the hopes that she'll get to where she's urinating properly, which hopefully would indicate proper kidney function. But then it's still a damn crapshoot. If there's been too much muscle damage, the animal wouldn't be any good for itself anyway. Stoney had come prepared for the long haul when we described to him what was happening over the phone, and he stopped at his office and brought several cases of those electrolyte fluid bags along with a week's supply of milk replacement for the baby. He gets himself all set up in that stall like he knows that tomorrow's a hell of a long ways off and he expects to still be there with the mare alongside of him and that he's bound that they'll both see the morning together. And he sews a catheter tube into her jugular and suspends the first bag from a spike he's nailed to an overhead beam and clips the long clear tube at the mare's neck. And I watch with him for a few minutes as the line of the fluid in the first bag begins to fall. Elizabeth's mixed up a batch of that milk replacement. She's got a bottle of it with a lamb's nipple attached to it, and she's sitting in the next stall with a foal, talking to it and rubbing its forehead, trying to get it interested in what she's got to offer. I kneel down with her, and I tell her I'll get the baby started, and could she get Stoney some dinner, which reminds me we hadn't had our own yet either, and she goes off. Well, the baby keeps nosing around the nipple in my hand with that wonderful soft skin of the newborn, and I'm setting up against her, mumbling some foolishness in her ear as I watch at her eyes, wide and new, and her eyelashes when she blinks somehow makes me smile. And she finally gets it in her mind to try what's behind the nipple and begins drawing at it with those lovely eyes of hers going back and forth and every now and again looking right at me as she pulls continually on the bottle. Looks to me like she's found herself a daddy. Stoney says, and I look up, and he's standing against the open stall with his arms crossed on his chest and a big smile on that mug of his. The mare's quiet. We'll keep the fluids to her as long as it takes. Will she eat anything, I asked him. Oh, she'll nibble some of the grain every now and again, but she's not real interested in it. The baby takes another bottle of the milk substitute and then just puts its chin down on its knee and closes its eyes and goes to sleep. And I move away and close the stall door real quiet like so as it'll take its rest. We all eat in the runway with Stoney checking on the fluid bags every now and again. He's got three of them strung together hanging there so as it gives us time to eat our dinner. But while we're still at it, there's a thrashing from the baby's stall and we look in at her just beginning to get her legs. She gets her hind legs under her, nearly locked, and pauses that way, quivering, but every time she goes to rise up off her elbow, she rocks back and falls over. And Stoney goes back to the mare, and Elizabeth goes in to feed the foal. She'll do her, I say, standing back and watching, for it's always been a miracle to me, the birth, and then seeing them making themselves stand upright and soon after bouncing and jumping around like they'd been practicing their locomotion for months instead of hours. Elizabeth crouches in the corner beside the little thing as it thrashes itself back into the same position, pushing its hind legs a quivering with its little tail sucked right flat up against its butt. And Elizabeth, she slides her hand open flat under its belly, not barely touching, as it pushes up off its front and starts over again, she supports up under it so that all four legs are now straight and locked, and it hesitates for just a moment, quivering and shaking with its new little muscles that only an hour or so ago had been something to paddle with, and it picks up one foreleg for its first step, but it topples back down again before getting it accomplished. This time its knees buckling under, 
and it falling directly on its face. Don't take very much to learn to fall, Stoney says quietly beside me. But the getting back up again, I say, the will to get back up. I, Stoney says, for each and every one of us, I reckon, and inside myself, I say, amen. And then again, amen. We get Stoney all fixed up with a pillow and that ancient old quilt that weighs about 12 pounds. And Elizabeth feeds her filly again, which had been sleeping on its side, weary from the far journey it had traveled that evening, all the way from the far inland tide that had cast it up on a violent and fearful beach of soft, dark hay. And then more wondrous than fearful, amid the quiet hours of myriad discovery, where it had found itself not sea creature at all, but something apparently unsuited for its new environment, and at last precariously, a fragile, tottering, stick-legged thing with its first hunger sated and then its first airy dream, no longer of warm and dark and limitless seas, but perhaps of unimagined places its legs, once they walked more harmoniously, might take it. For it had finally walked its first few steps and known already warmth after its first frightening discovery of cold. And it had found again the familiar darkness after its first incomprehensible discovery of light, and it had tasted of something that seemed to quiet the hollow place in its diminutive gut. And there appeared to be many mothers for its choosing, none that slept beside it now, but many kindly mothers nonetheless. Stoney tells Elizabeth that he'll feed the baby through the night as long as he's right there, for she'll no longer have such a luxury after he leaves. And no, she says, she... Reckon she'll be in that baby stall every two hours for the next three days, and she'll proceed onward from there until the poor little thing is all ready for weaning. And I can see right then and there that this whole event is going to provide a whole passel of experience for someone. And as I walk back to the house by myself, I figure that I'm probably the one that's about to be re-educated. For Elizabeth, she seems to know just precisely where this whole deal's headed. And I'm damned if she isn't up and down all night long those first few nights. And when the filly can finally go for four whole hours at a time, it's almost like a vacation, <laughs> at least to me and our alarm clock. Like when you get a spade at 20 or 30 below zero weather and it sets in real good and firm some ways after the new year, why a rise up to say five below zero is near to almost being downright tropical. And a day that makes it all the way to old Zed himself is practically shirt sleeve weather, making you wonder as you leave the house if you really do need your coat or not. And though you still got nearly five months to go, you know that spring is absolutely inevitable. And hellfire, a man's hopefulness can just about soar on rosy new wings unfettered. <laughs> I've already finished shaving and I'm nearly dressed when the clock goes off for the six o'clock feeding. And I tell her that I'll take care of that one and I'll see her that evening. I guess she'd fit Stoney some food at four o'clock and as I enter the barn, all is quiet. I creep past the baby's stall and she is asleep on her side with her legs stretched out straight as if she were dreaming of standing squarely upright. And then I look in at the mare and Stoney and I'll be damned. The lights over each of the stalls are off, but the ones spaced apart over the runway are still on, and the last dim bulb is opposite the mare's stall so that the baby lies in near darkness, and the dull half-light spreads halfway across Stoney and the mama. He's got the fluid dripping at a slower rate now, and of the three most recent bags that hang from the ceiling, she's almost through with the second one. A couple of empty plates are stacked up and pushed off to one side, with a fork laid across him. And Stoney is sitting in the bedded hay with his back against the stall partition and his legs out before him and with the mare's face partially across his thigh. He's got the quilt wrapped about his shoulders, but it's nearly fallen off of one side of him. His one arm is lying across the mare's neck and his face rests on her head. And they're both sound asleep. His other arm is flung back beside him away from the horse 
with the fingers of that hand barely resting on a saucer that holds an empty teacup as if he had just had the time to set it down before sleep had finally overtaken him in mid-stride, so to speak. All God's creatures, I think to myself as I stand there watching them, and the beauty of it, of the oneness of life. And I'm almost afraid that if I blink, I might disturb them. All God's creatures. Away in a manger, no crib for his bed. The little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head. The stars in the sky looked down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. The cattle Look down from the sky and stay by my side until morning is nigh. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay close by me forever and love me. All the dear children with thy tender care and fit us for heaven to live with thee there. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The Lay down his sweet head. The stars in the sky look down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. Gifts we bring, pa -ra -pa -pum -pum, to lay before the king, pa -ra -pa -pum -pum, ra -pa -pum -pum, ra -pa -pum -pum. for to honor him, pa -ra -pa -pum. I have no gift to bring pa -ra -pa -pum -pum. 
that's fit to give a king pa rum pa pum pum rum pa pum pum rum pa pum pum Shall I play for you pa rum pa pum pum on my drum The ox and lamb kept time. I played my drum for him. I played my best for him. And then he smiled at me, pa ra pa pum pum. Me and my drum. The barn was closed off to the boys the whole day of Christmas Eve, and Spencer would be all day there, no matter how cold it was. Luke remembered how small he was, and Whitney too, and how Lonnie, who was older, was always the leader. How they always wanted to do what Lonnie was doing, and how he and Whitney, in his mind, when they were that small, were always wrestling and tumbling over each other like little puppies. How they never seemed to tire of climbing over and under and falling and climbing back and falling yet again over each other. And how Lonnie and Luke's remembering always seemed to have this patient kindness for them. As if he were older than, say, his nine years. The shepherd to his diminutive flock of five-year-olds. Luke's remembrance of Elizabeth when they were that small was of all that day cooking. And the smells of it beginning by late in the morning and building and sweeping on right through Christmas Day when the smells of all of it would reach a kind of fragrant crescendo that by the time they would finally set down to Christmas dinner would have nearly exhausted their senses, living all day in a fever of expectation, and her stopping variously to see that they were bundled up enough against the cold and then ushering them toward the door with Lonnie taking them each by the hand. You boys can walk up toward Doris's to see those lights, but be home before it gets dark, please. But we want to ride blue, Whitney says, who when we were small was the biggest animal we were allowed to be around. A great big 16 and a half hand blue roan gelding, as old and as gentle as a long-legged old grandfather who had to be wary of where he placed his feet so that he would do nothing to jeopardize that stance of his legs. Tired and knobbly, but still getting him eventually to where he figured he wanted to go. So solicitously careful when we were about him that in later years I wondered if he had somehow gained an instinct for us as being tiny two-legged creatures akin to the imagined long-lost phantom sons and grandsons never yet birthed into being out of his dim and indistinct memory behind that single regard on his graying face bespeaking a boundless kind-eyed patience that somehow in the ancient way of the beast loved the young, the puppies and the kittens and the little boys, too. And Elizabeth says, not today, boys. You mind that barn, Lonnie, and be back before it's dark. And Lonnie says, yes, sir. And we're tumbling and shoving each other down the long, long road that finally crosses the first cattle guard, smoothed over with snow that runs out of the ranch. The ground would be all filled up with the darkness of night when we'd finally leave the house to go down to the barn. And the western end of the sky, above and behind the high country, 
would just barely yet hold the very last of the light of day, fading so quickly that if you didn't think to watch for it, you'd forget and miss the very last of it, the day's end. There'd be four or five pickup trucks parked below the barn, and some of the folks from various surrounding ranches approaching it with their kids as we walked down from the house. And my remembrance is always of a crystal clear moonless night when the temperature is already below zero and the snow crunching so loud under our boots that you could hear the steps of the people all the way on the other side of the barn walking up from where they'd parked. And the stars by then, the stars seemed so full and distinct in the sky that you'd almost feel as if you could hear them, like the burning of distant torches if you were to stop and really listen. There was one huge one in the east in the winter that I always remembered, and Whitney and I assumed it to be the same star that all the stories told about. It gave off color, and it stayed there all through the cold. Lonnie told us sometime later that it was the eye of the constellation of the dog, and we liked knowing that because our reference on the ground was so intertwined with animals that it seemed only right for the stars to have a similar reference also. You could hear John Farrell's guitar from inside the barn when you were still ways away from it. Harley's Uncle John, who everybody called John Farrell, as if his two names, first and last, were really one name put together. The sound of the guitar and the clarity of the newborn night made everybody quiet as they approached the loveliness of it, like an earth-bred accompaniment, achingly simple and pure, to the whelming night, like a universe cut from glass so thin and fragile at the same time that it's unimaginably deep and far, with the crunching snow and the sounds of the guitar on this side of the cold, and the stars close and far on the other side. Whitney and I and Lonnie would all have fallen into that hush as we walked, and Elizabeth would squeeze my hand in my mitten without saying anything, and I could see her face in my mind without having to look up at her. We'd all be hushed as we entered the barn, as if it were really a church of sorts, and as I remember it, I really can't imagine any difference. In the far corner against where the wall met the first stall was where Spencer would have set up the tree that late the day before he had cut and drug down from somewhere off the far ridge that sat behind and above the ranch. Lonnie went with him on horseback, and we saw them watching from the parlor window, walking their horses in the darkness, coming up the wide snow-filled pasture with Lonnie's horse first and Spencer just to the side and slightly behind him, with the tree tied off at his saddle horn and dragging over the surface of the snow. It was all candles. The whole tree was all hung somehow with lit candles, so many of them that their light seemed to fill with a soft delicacy nearly all the darkness. The light from the candles was so sharp a vision in me when we'd enter from out of the hard cold blackness of the new night that it seemed to hurt me in my chest with how beautiful it was, the shocking delicate vision of that light. And then you would see that all amongst the candles were hung apples and carrots and a countless array of fruits and vegetables wherever the broad boughs of the tree would support them. Hay bales would be set all about the earthen floor so that they formed sitting places around and back away from the tree and divided the barn in half with three or four horses all groomed with a tiny red and green knot of ribbon tied in their forelocks walking freely about the other side of the bales and eating from the scattered hay and mounded grain that Spencer had set there for them. Several yearling cattle would be settled in two or three of the stalls, and a number of sheep would be in each of the other two stalls next to them. John Farrow would be sitting on one of the bales and playing and humming along to his fingers, picking on the strings of his instrument. With those gloves that leave the finger's tips exposed, we thought he'd cut them out so he'd be able to play in the cold. And I remembered having a thought about cutting off the top of my mittens, but seemed to forget about it before actually getting it done. There'd be platters of cookies and pitchers of juice for the kids, an eggnog for the folks, and enough glasses to go all round, all set up on trays on top of three bales, piled one on top of the other against the near wall. The kids would break away from the folks, and the folks would cluster on the other side of John Farrow with handshakes all around, 
and all the good wishes spoken back and forth to each other that I seem to remember, along with the knowledge of people living close enough to the earth to be kin to the various other families of creatures living there also in a harsh and generally ungiving environment that made us all, the pharaohs, the next ranch over nearly four miles away, and Ali Wheatman and his family and his hands and their families nearly 15 miles off to the south, all neighbors, folks that work much longer hours than their work animals, from dark to dark and most always beyond, day after day, without heed of arbitrary divisions of time into weeks and months, and telling the passage of it in a lesser sense, from the daily birth and building and the diminishing and disappearing of the light, and from the subtle, inexorable nightly waxing and waning of the moon, and with the less awareness from the awesome endless concentric circles of the fiery and yearning stars, and the greater sense of it by the births and deaths of the creatures given and removed from life in our high, clear valley, rimmed by the near hills on the one side and the harsh crystalline mass of the far mountains on the other, by the deaths and births of all the creatures that frequented that tiny niche of earth, winged and two- and four-legged, and silver swimmers and arrow-like flyers and runners horned and not with cloven feet and some with ten toes, the peach fuzz turning to whiskers on the Son of Man. And coming up from the barn some warm Saturday evening and seeing the gangly little girl you'd known right from seed suddenly standing on the porch like her own lovely ghost waiting on the breeze and hugging you round your neck that had to still smell of the horse you'd been chewing, saying, Your supper will get cold, Daddy, and kissing her cheek, a woman with her mother in her eyes and her own daughter there, too, if you're wise enough to see that far, and time turning gray in your own beard and your hands like limp old claws turned horny with callus, with the fingers cracking in the death-like cold and healing over, with the earth under the healed places and cracking open again like fissures in the frozen ground, waiting for the renewal of spring to restore what is held in abeyance back to the moist and fecund flesh. Another winter. For time here wasn't generally referred to in years, but rather in the winters we have lived through. The sun is low and the warmth is brief and the light lives on between the dark and the dark. John Farrell would be singing softly at first so that we hadn't paid it any heed, as clear and soft in the pristine candlelight of the tree, as the sound that had been given voice by something gentle in the wind, until one by one the grown-ups would join in along with him, with the kids kind of gravitating back to lean against their folks' knees, as their young voices would catch a word here and there and make up the others, as their folks went along in the path that John Farrow led them, a pure and simple rising of voices, with some one or two of the ranchers droning along, as if they'd caught themselves on one tone that probably sounded in their own ears as if they were warbling away in close harmony to those who were actually singing to the song's melody. A joining of voices in that delicate light that somehow seemed to generate a real warmth, a suspiration of living breath and a warmth that was absolute, as if each of the creatures that lay or stood or sat in that drafty close place made enough of a contribution to the engendered atmosphere to actually produce a living heat from out of the barren cold that pressed against the outside walls. Then Spencer would set his spectacles low on his nose and stand close in front of the tree so that the light from it fell across his shoulders and onto the large child's book that he held and read from about the baby and the animals and how the animals were all given human speech on this one night. And as I listened to the story which Spencer read every year 
I remembered again that I'd planned to get up later in the night and get dressed and tiptoe out of the house and get my boots on just inside the front door and come back down to the barn so that I could hear what each of the horses and dogs and cats and the cattle and sheep, what each of them would really sound like when they spoke words, wondering what they would say to each other and especially what they would say to me when I spoke to them. And Whitney looks at me from the corner of his eye so that I know he's thinking the same thing. But we wake up late, sometime before dawn, but way after midnight, and Whitney's already awake and dressing himself in the dark, and I rush to catch up with him, and he whispers fiercely, Pa said they do it at midnight. And I whisper back at him, tucking the flannel hurriedly into my jeans, Maybe they're still doing it, though, at least while it's still night. And we hurry down the stairs, shushing each other and holding the railing in the darkness, the cold freezes the inside of my nose. It's so cold, and I breathe into the collar of my jacket. It's still night for sure, and the stars twinkle like fiery globes all above us, and Sirius hangs just above the roof of the barn, sparkling with red and blue and white light as we slip past the barn door, sliding it open just enough so we can squeeze through and then closing it behind us. Lemon comes quietly to my hand and noses into my fingers but doesn't say anything. Even when I kneel down against him, rubbing his great head against my chest. Hi, Lemon. Hi, Lemon. And I know his mouth smiles when I rub his ears, but still he doesn't say anything back to me. And I turn the light on in the tack room and leave its door open so that the light spreads out into the barn and I hear Whitney over by Blue Stall whispering to him while he stands up on a hay bale and watches down past the animal whose head is lifted up in the frail light with his legs folded and tucked under him and his gentle eyes blinking against our intrusion. Hi, Blue. <laughs> Hi, Blue. And I stand beside Whitney and watch into the stall at the horse's face as he continues to blink into wakefulness with his lovely pale eyelashes. We can hear animals down the other line of stalls in the L-shaped barn, restive in the darkness and groaning yet with sleep, and one of them drinking and knocking against his stall, and another whinnying softly as if to himself, instantly reminding me, then in memory as well as now, how I've always loved the voice of horses for my entire life. It's too late, I whisper to Whitney. We got here too late. And Whitney whispers back to me, I know, but next year we have to remember. And I whisper back at him, yes, we have to remember next year. He always plays Silent Night Last, maybe three or four times all strung together. And everybody knows the words to it, and we all of us sing it with him. And without knowing why, the beauty of the music with all the people huddled together warm out of the vast cold, under the delicate candlelight, out of the vast dark, makes me feel as if the beauty, which I didn't then know the word for it, was nearly too big to hold all at once, as if it were somehow just too big. So for a moment I have to stop my singing and swallow two or three times before I can make the sound come back up out of me. I'm leaning against Elizabeth's legs as she sets against Spencer, sitting on a couple of hay bales, with Whitney leaning against his legs and against me, and Lonnie on Spencer's other side with Spencer's arm around him and his other hand resting on Whitney's shoulder, and Elizabeth's arm around Spencer's back and her other hand resting over my chest. And by the time we come to the sleep in heavenly peace line, her hand lifts off me and rises to her face for a moment, and then rests back over my chest so that I can see her face again in my mind without turning to look up at her, even knowing the water in her eyes and slipping over her cheek like a line of quicksilver in the candlelight. And her hand goes off me again and rises up and then back down and rests against me again. And I don't have to look at it either, laying warm on me, because I know how it looks in my mind too, just as I know her face. Besides, I can't take my eyes off the candles. How wondrous a vision they are to me for some reason. As we sit there singing, 
the quivering light all interlaced through the trees, making me think of how aspen leaves quiver when the wind blows into them in the middle of summer, so that if they were to become any kind of light, they would probably be the leaves that the candlelight would turn into, because they seem to quiver in a delicate kind of rustling movement in just exactly the same way. Sleep, I think for all the massed days and clicking years of my tiny, flickering life. Sleep. I think of Spencer, who sold parties with the antelope, smelling of sage and horse lather, and covered by the insubstantial globe of a great tumbleweed, whose dry and vein-like branches try to hold the silent wind. Sleep. I think of Elizabeth, who blows, like her long, damp hair from under the firm hand of the sea wind, watching forever the endless monument of the fastened waves as she rises and falls on a white gull's wing that are flawed with a single spot of red, singing to Spencer, who circles her tirelessly on the darkened wings of a hawk that are tipped with scarlet. Sleep, I think of Lonnie, who carries his gentleness like a food to be offered to anyone that approaches him, hungry for it or not, his silvery wings but pin feathers and marked as with an obscure necklace of crimson, like something hovering in the air that is still colored by it long after sunset. And sleep, I think, to myself, for all of us, for all of us beating fiercely against the wind, or lying placidly beneath its cool flow with broken hands and wondrous wings and blinded eyes that see even beyond seeing the same wordless dream built of the same heart-crushing sorrow and the same unspeakable loveliness all at the same time. How beautiful and sad it is all at the same time. And sleep, I think, for all of us, sleep, I think, at last. Oh, sleep in heavenly peace. Sleep. Silent night, holy night, oh. All is bright Round yon virgin Mother and child Holy infant So tender and mild Sleep in heavenly peace Sleep in heavenly peace Silent night Holy night Shepherds quake at the sight Radiant beams from thy holy with the dawn of redeeming grace, Christ the Savior is born. Christ the Savior is born. Silent night, oh. Son of God, love's pure light, glory streams from heaven afar, heavenly hosts sing hallelujah, Jesus Lord at thy birth. Silent night, 